Hello, everybody. Welcome to another Telescope Talk Hangout. My name is Tony Darnell from DeepAstronomy.Space, and we these Hangouts are a relatively new thing on this channel because, thanks to OPT Telescopes, we have a sponsor, and we are going to be talking about all kinds of things in amateur astronomy throughout this throughout this Hangout series. There's two kinds of telescope talk hangouts. One of them is geared towards amateur astronomy. That's people who want to go outside in their backyard and look up and understand the, the, the night sky twirling over our heads. They also want to buy telescopes or they might, you might be thinking about getting some equipment. Well, this is the hangout for you because OPT telescopes has a staff of people who are extremely knowledgeable on helping you not only get started in amateur astronomy, but also, uh, if you're an advanced amateur, giving you advice on things you might want or need. So this this is the hangout for the amateur astronomers and then on the, the following Tuesdays we have a professional version where we talk to professional astronomers from ground-based observatories around the world. Uh, so there's both kinds going on and we hope you'll check them all out and let us know how you like them by giving us thumbs up or sharing these videos to everybody else and let and let your friends know that there's a really cool group of people talking about astronomy and you need to get involved. So uh, and you, you, all your friends, I promise, will um, thank you for that. <laughs> okay, so today's topic in Astro, uh, in uh, our telescope talk hangout is going to be getting started in, astro, in astrophotography. I get it. You've bought your telescope, or maybe you have a really cool DSLR that you've been hanging on to and you use every day when you go to the zoo or when you go take Instagram photos or whatever it is, but you would like to take some images of the stars. And you're not quite sure how to start. You don't know where to begin. Uh, should you, what, what equipment should you, should you buy? And how hard is it to do? Well, this hangout, we're going to address all of those issues and many more. So let me bring up my little, panel here and these are the guys from OPT telescopes right next to me is uh Ian Lauer he is uh is uh, a stat I don't know your title Ian so I'll just say you're a staff member but the, below <laughs> us right there is Dustin Gibson uh the co-owner of OPT so hi Dustin hi Ian welcome to the hangout Tony, good to see you again, man. It's uh, been a long time. No see, right? That, that's right. We, we, we just finished a, a recording a, a podcast on Friday, which we're going to be doing every Friday, yeah. uh, posting the following week, and I'm currently getting that podcast ready to go. So yeah, yeah, lots of content we're doing there, Dustin, and it's going to be, I think, really cool stuff. Yeah, oh, you know, for sure. These are exciting times, and the podcast was a blast, man. I, th I think that that's been so needed for so long. I can't wait for people to hear it, and uh, hopefully everybody enjoys it as much as we enjoy making it. Yeah, and uh, I'm, I'm going to be posting it, uh, and I haven't set up the platform in the syndication yet. That's happening this week. I will be, I will promise to, uh, set out the, or send out the, the links and everything so you can subscribe later this week. And Dustin will also, uh, uh, post it on his social media stuff too. So we'll let you guys know yeah. when that, when that becomes available, but it's imminent. It's coming out. <laughs> it is imminent for sure. All right. So you guys are in California. I'm in Florida. We are three hours apart from each other, but that doesn't stop us. Thanks to technology, we can talk about things uh, right away. We are live on YouTube, Twitter, Twitch, and Facebook, and I'm monitoring all of them, but I also have a Discord server where the link to that is in the description box. Please, um, please check it out, and I'm monitoring that as well, so you can ask us your questions and comments throughout this Hangout. All right, where should we start, guys? Uh, well, we're talking about astrophotography, so we're, uh, it's a really simple, simple discussion today, right? I mean, there's nothing complex about astrophotography. <laughs> yeah, <really. laughs> One of the easiest hobbies to get into. That's what I've heard. Yeah, that's not usually how I recommend people get started in, in, in the hobby, but this is not, yeah, this is, this is already assuming you know something about the night sky, right, guys? I mean, we're kind of not assuming a neophyte level here, correct? Because. Shh. Sure. Yeah, I think that's okay. fair. I okay. mean, and, you know, there are there are a couple of things. So with astrophotography, generally, I mean, we should probably start, let me back up, we should probably start from the simplest type of astrophotography, because it can get really convoluted and really complex very, very quickly. And if we dive right in, it's going to feel like, oh, you have to have all this gear, you have to have all this equipment, you've got to be counteracting the Earth's rotation at exactly the rate, you know, and it's got to be within a pixel and all of this stuff. And, and that's not true. That's not the simplest level of astrophotography. And it's not really how anybody dives in. So why don't we start with 
what we see as the simplest type of astrophotography and what's absolutely required for that. Because I know, Tony, you said you've shot astrophotography off of a rock before. Yeah, it can be that simple. I mean, I don't know. It's uh, uh, let's yeah, let's let's start there. Let's I think this is my personal opinion. The easiest way to start taking pictures of the stars doesn't even involve a telescope. Really, you just need a camera with a decent lens on it. Now, I there's in the way you do that is you take a a DSLR and you you set it down on a sturdy tripod or on a rock or something like that and you just open the shutter. Now, you do need a DSLR that has that capability where you can open the shutter indefinitely. So that's a pretty important quality, although you can set really long uh, exposure times on the order of minutes on some of them, but that's the easiest way. And then what that does is it opens up your camera to the sky and those feeble photons coming in from the stars hit that CCD and gradually build up an image. And so that's, and that's easy. Uh, but, but my question guys is if you want to take, and, and, and then you can also take time lapses where you can just take periodic photos throughout the course of the night and then build up a movie of, fr of frames where each, each image is a movie. And then at the end of the night, you can watch the stars travel across the sky in order to make that kind of, uh, time lapse guys, what mm -hmm. kind of lens would you recommend? We already know you need a DSLR camera, sure, but sure. what kind of lens would you recommend and exposure times and also like F stops and all that other stuff? Yeah. So at the simplest level, if we're just getting into what's absolutely required, I think you're right. All that's needed is a camera. And it, it really doesn't even have to be a DSLR, does it? As long as you can control the shutter speed and control the basic camera functions. I mean, people have done amazing time lapses with cell phones. So as long as you can control the, uh, you know, the basic functions of a camera, then really any camera will do. But I think that, um, yeah, if we're looking at, you know, what type of lens, if you do have a DSLR or a mirrorless camera, what type of lens is going to be best for astrophotography? I mean, I think the simple answer is generally wide angle and fast, right? I mean, is that, is that kind of what you guys would agree with? It's, you want to be wide if you're, especially the Milky Way is huge. Well, what do you mean by fast? So fast, the F ratio of the lens. So how much light it can gather at which rate? Right. So, I mean, you have some lenses. So when people say like, hey, my lens is F 1.4 or, you know, F 16 or whatever it is, you know, the lower the number, the faster the lens. So you would want that that one four or that two eight lens compared to maybe like a lot of zoom lenses might be F 5.6 or F 7. And, uh, you know, the faster the lens, the more light you're going to gather very quickly. So you don't have to deal with as many of the problems when you're wide. You're not going to see so many you know, star trails, unless it's intentional, you know, for longer exposures, you can do a longer exposure without starting to see some of the problems that come in with, you know, uh, the earth spinning and those types of things. Does that make sense? Yeah. Does a fast lens also mean wide field? Not or necessarily. Or the other way around? Is it inverse to that? No, no, not necessarily. So yeah, the, the speed of the lens is just the simply, simply just the opening, um, divided into the focal length of the lens. So how much magnification divided across, you know, how wide is the lens? So how much light is it gathering for the surface area of the lens? And so that's, that's kind of what we're looking at. And that gives you the number that we're talking about. So obviously the wider the lens, the bigger the light bucket it is. And then the shorter the focal length, the wider the field of view is going to be. So generally people want wide, fast lenses, but they do make zoom lenses that are pretty fast. I mean, you can even get telephoto lenses that are in the F2 range. So, you know, it's not necessarily if you find a, a low or a fast focal ratio lens that it means it's going to be wide field. That's not necessarily the case. Right. Because wide field or because the focal ratio of a lens is determined by both the diameter and the right. focal length that it takes the right. lens system to focus light to a point uh, or right. onto an image plane. The only thing you really get to play with on most camera lenses is the objective lens size, the diameter of the objective. And they do that with a stop. They, they exactly, basically right. just cover up part of the lens. So by opening it up all the way, you're letting all of the light in that can possibly get into that lens and you're making it very fast as well. Now I've yeah. seen, I've seen, um, fisheye lenses or are they fisheye lenses? What are they? They like, so, so what is a wide field? Are they like 25 millimeter lenses? Cause you, when you go most telescope, 
telescopes. Most cameras come with a 50 millimeter lens, right? When you buy mm-hmm. them. So right. what, what would you want to get to do a wider field? Generally, when I hear people describing wide angle lenses, they're talking about 30 millimeters and under. Okay. Um, so, you know, you see a lot of 16s, you see some people with 12 millimeters, but, um, you know, the wider the lens, the more context you're going to have in the image, the more of the foreground you're going to have, and then the more of the Milky Way itself, because again, you know, the Milky Way spans across the entire sky, you know, and so the wider the lens, the more of it you can capture in your image. The, uh, the longer the focal length, the more detail you can get in between the stars and the more resolution on the target itself. So, I mean, it is a little bit of a trade-off, but 99% of the images you see out there are just wide-angle lenses that shoot super fast. Yeah, and a lot of the time, too, you'll see a, a panoramic, right? So you'll see multiple images stitched together. So if you're not using a, a, a wide-field lens... And you can use a long focal length lens and then stitch them together. Then you have really nice detail on the Milky Way and you get that wide field. It's, it, I mean, a lot of those images that I see, let's see, on Instagram, all over the Internet, Reddit, all those places, those are either stitched together images or it's a single shot with a wide, uh, wide, wide angle lens. Right. Um, Do you need so those any special are really the two, two ways that, that, that people go about taking these images? Do you need any special fixtures or anything to get those wide angle uh, panorama shots, Ian? Like, like I know some cameras, if you have a smartphone, you can take a panorama and, you know, twirl around, but, uh, and, and it'll stitch it all together for you. But if you're doing that with a DSLR, you don't have that ability, do you? Right. So you take one exposure, you, you frame your shot, take one exposure, then you just move your camera, do another frame. You know, you change where you want to be imaging. So you'll have one sh- uh, one area that you want to image, take the exposure, let's say it's 30 seconds, and then you move your camera, tilt it in a different direction where you want to see, and you're going to have it showing. So it's going to be uh, uh, another section. So you can get the, the entire Milky Way spanning across the sky. And uh, uh, do you, so with the, with the, um, what about exposure time? So do you need, you said about the, do, I guess my point is if you take it and you move it over a little bit, you eat with each shot, you're not going to get the exact same look. So you've got to maybe compensate a little bit with the exposure times on each one. Like what if the moon is kind of in one side of the sky and, and, and not on another, do you have to worry about that very much? Uh, I mean, you can, but generally you're not shooting Milky Way when the moon's out, you know, no matter, it's like a huge street lamp in the sky. So <laughs> no matter where you are, you can be in the darkest skies ever. If the moon's out, it's, it's going to be a lot of uh, light pollution and you're going to lose a lot of the signal of the Milky Way. But yeah, I mean, I see what you're saying. The closer you get to the moon, you might want to cut your exposure slightly so you don't get those massive gradients. But um, I'd say that's, that's definitely a way more advanced type of shooting than just what we're kind of talking about is what's the absolute minimum I can do here to get a great shot of the Milky Way or get a great shot of a nebula yeah. or, or whatever it is. And I, I think the best way to simple it down, to simplify it, is you have your DSLR, a wide angle lens, 30 or less, and you put it on a tripod, point it at the Milky Way, 30 second shot, and then go from there. You know, oh, adjust okay. your ISO accordingly, but that is the simplest way. Well, hang on, don't it. just say uh, adjust ISO accordingly. What does that mean? <laughs> and and what what is a good setting? <laughs> How would yeah. I know that I've got it set right? Sure. So, I mean, if we just if we just take this to the simplest level, if we just say, okay, you have your camera and there's three things that you're going to control. You're going to control the shutter speed. So how long of an exposure are we going to do? And let's say Ian's saying as a starting place, no matter what lens you have, just as a starting place, set it to 30 seconds. Most cameras can do that right out of the camera. Okay. So we've got one of those three things nailed. The second thing is going to be the aperture we were just talking about. How fast can the lens shoot? And so for that piece, let's say no matter what lens it is, it doesn't matter if it's a five F5.6 or an F1.4. It doesn't matter. Whatever lens you have, set it to as fast as it can possibly go. So now we've got two of the three things nailed. And then what we're going to do is the last piece is your ISO. And that's essentially the gain on your camera. It's like uh, turning up the volume on a stereo, right? We're going to take that signal and how much are we going to amplify it? And so I think what Ian's saying is if the image is too dark after the fact, take that ISO number that's in your camera and it might be set, you know, automatically to say 400, bump it up to maybe 1600 and you're going to see your image get brighter and you can kind of use that ISO setting to, 
uh, maximize you know the the signal in your image. And if you get to a certain point where, okay, the ISO is introducing noise in my image, then you know, okay, I have to stop here. Here's the limit. And then you start going back to the other two. You know you have to stay fast. So that's where you start adjusting shutter speed again. You say, okay, I can go a little bit shorter or I can go a little bit longer with shutter speed. But you just kind of want to take those three and process of elimination them out, right? And do you check your uh, do you check your images just sitting there on the camera viewfinder or do you have a another way of checking to see if they're too dark or too bright uh how yeah no i mean field? i i do i'm not sure how you guys do it but man i'm like it's like going fishing or something right i mean you're you're doing this long exposure and then you're watching it and this thing pops up on the screen and i freak out every time man. every <laughs> time it, ne it never gets old but it's in like you know it pops up on the screen and a lot of the images i post to gibson pics on instagram people see this stuff and i always get the question did you just paint that in Photoshop? Did you create that? And so a lot of times I post the raw image that came just out of the camera as well, just to show like, no, while I'm standing there, this is what pops up in the camera. It's the most insane experience ever to see the entire galaxy before you, right? Yeah, no kidding. Now, right before uh, before the days of the CCDs and back when I, I, I grew up using Hyper 2415 film, we did a thing called bracketing. And this was something that you, you were at the telescope, you were taking a bunch of images, and you wanted to try and play with all of the different settings, just like Dustin said, but uh, you couldn't, you didn't have the benefit of an LCD screen to, to check them out on the fly. You, if, if you don't want to, and this is what I do at a telescope when I'm just busy trying to get a bunch of images and I don't want to look at every single one, I'll bracket. So by bracketing, it just means playing with that ISO, take a series of them with different ISO numbers of everything that you're doing. It means a lot of images, but who cares? I mean, you've got SD cards to hold all that now. And mm -hmm. so, you know, that, that keeps you from having to sit there and wonder, you know, oh my gosh, um, the, uh, uh, I don't, you know, this setting didn't give me any good photos or any images or whatever. So that's another thing you can do at the, uh, at the camera outside, uh, as well. Okay. So, um, that's good. That's a, pl that's one place to get started. Okay. This is an easy, you don't even need a telescope for this. You can go out. If you have a wide angle lens, that works too. Uh, but if you just have the tele, the lens that came with your telescope or even as a, as, although I haven't ever seen, maybe, maybe there are, maybe smartphones do a better job than I think. But have you guys really seen good? Yeah stuff with the smartphone oh yeah absolutely i've seen some pretty good stuff and so my camera that i use for a lot of my milky way stuff is right here and you can see how small this thing is like it's not some huge professional camera i mean this thing's tiny i mean look at this lens right there's nothing to it so it doesn't have to be some huge expensive system some of the best images i've seen have been from cameras you can walk in and buy it like a walmart or you know a best buy or whatever okay well, well good so i think let me get to James Dugan's question and then we'll go on to telescopes and, and telescope techniques. But he's asking, and, and this kind of, you just sort of answered it just now. As a first DSLR, what price range is a good starter camera and what model uh, should he get if you can recommend one? You want to take this? Me... Starter DSLR. Uh, okay. So um, I'm super biased. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But I will say that everybody shooting Astro should be shooting Fujifilm cameras at this point for digital. Really? Looks like, yeah, I think Ian's saying the same thing. <laughs> and the reason is because they have different sensor technology. Um, I've tried, so, I mean, literally everything from Hasselblad, Leica, Sony, um, everything. I mean, I've owned all of them and I've compared, I've done comparison shots. Actually, I'll send you these so that we can post these for people to see. It's unbelievable the difference when using what they call an X trans sensor. And these are a third of the price that a lot of the other cameras are. So they're not expensive, but they perform so extremely well in, um, in, Astro and for a lot of reasons and I'll, I'll go into that now but and, and you should know like we don't even sell Fuji cameras so it's not me saying like, hey buy this buy this we don't even sell them. what's the price range on those uh I think the they start what 500 bucks yeah exactly about, about 500 bucks for like a I mean at least you can do professional images with that yeah and another good route people can go is used DSLRs there's a yeah, lot of used DSLRs sure. you can get for very very cheap and you can do Astro shots with those so I definitely recommend going used with DSLR if you're if you're looking at price. Okay. But what I like what I like about Fuji is that a couple of things. One, so every camera, and this is going to be a little complex. I'll simplify it as much as I can for anybody that's never like looked at camera sensors or anything like that. But 
camera sensors, when they're color, have something called a Bayer matrix, and which is, it's what gives the camera the color. So essentially all sensors are monochrome. They just read whether or not photons hit. And you can probably speak on that better than I can, but they're, they're just grabbing photons and collecting them. So what they do to tell it color is they put little filters over every individual pixel. And so it repeats in a pattern on almost every sensor out there. It just goes red, green, green, blue over and over again across the sensor. And that's Sony, Canon, Nikon, on and on, Hasselblad, all of them. And so the problem with that is that you've got red, green, green, blue. And when you look out into space, which color is it? When you're looking at nebulae and when you're looking at galaxies, which color is it that you see the least of, right? It's green. It's green. It's green. But half of your pixels by default are covered in green filters. So what Fuji did was they developed this X-Trans sensor, which repeats instead of over four pixels, it repeats over 36 pixels. So it's not randomized, but it looks a lot more randomized. And so if you took a Canon shot and then a Fuji shot side by side, I actually just did this for Leica and Fuji, um, you will see that the Leica image or whichever image it is, comes out as very, very green. And then the Fuji image you'll see a lot more of the hydrogen alpha. You'll see a lot more of those deep reds and it will just look like it's already processed in the camera. It looks like it's a modified camera and it's not, it's just the sensor technology Wow! for this purpose. All right. Well, there you go. <laughs> I did not know that. I always thought those were kind of low end cameras, but I guess uh, I, yeah, I've been out of it for a while. So yeah, no, guys, not at all. I mean, so what about, so, but basically Ian, you're saying also any DSLR that, you know, you can get used would also be a good, a good candidate for this as well. What yeah, if, definitely. What Canon, if, Nikon, Sony, Fuji, all those are great astro 200 cameras bucks, to get right. started with. 150, 200 bucks. You see them all the time. Now, as they come off the shelf, I was just talking with Superluminal on Discord before we started about this, and he reminded me that Alex Reinders, who is a German astrophotographer, says that you, there, you can, um, you can remove a filter off of, uh, most DSLRs that tend to block out a lot of the H alpha. Um, wavelengths, I guess that's sort of the rest toward the red. And, uh, have you guys heard of that where you can remove some filters that come, they, they, they already come standard on all these commercial or consumer grade DSLRs. Have you heard of that? Right. Yeah, absolutely. And, and people send them off. That's when you see online, you'll see, especially if you're looking for it, you'll see a lot of people that have modified DSLRs. That's exactly what they're talking about. So the sensor itself is already generally pretty sensitive in the uh, the red region, hydrogen alpha, and to the things that you're going to find in space. But um, yeah, if they go in and they remove these filters and they can make them, you know, even they can even filter out for specifically hydrogen alpha to make it ultra sensitive um, or to make it, you know, at least more signal coming through there with less noise of everything else coming through. Um, then, yeah, I mean, that's um, that's kind of the goal, right, is to collect more of what you're actually shooting for and less of everything else and so that's what modifying cameras does okay but you can't do that yourself right you have to get somebody to do that for you do you have to take it into uh, a, we, a shop we probably have we probably have some pretty intelligent listeners here i'd imagine there's probably some people listening that do that themselves. Oh, oh, okay <laughs> also it is something you can do if you've got the yeah yeah, yeah. To yeah. I, i've definitely known people that have done it themselves yeah okay all right uh all right well so there so we started from the camera, you know, with getting started in astrophotography, what if, well, let's start now with the telescope. What if all we have is a telescope and we want to start taking pictures through it? Um, what are the guidelines, first of all, for a good telescope candidate uh, to take images through? Yeah, well, uh, I guess we should start with the easiest way to take astrophotos. And I think that'd be with uh, your phone. Right. You can just take your phone out, put it up to the eyepiece and you got a picture of the moon. I mean, we do that all the time when we do outreach. We get a big job. We got it pointed at the moon. Everyone wants to take a picture of it. Mm -hmm. They just put their phone up to the eyepiece and take a photo. That is the simplest way to do astrophotography with, with the, the telescope. telescope right, yeah. And that works with really bright things like like you said, the planets or yep. the moon. Right. Exactly. Right. Yeah, but yeah, I mean, to your I think what you're getting at there is, yeah, if it's not a bright thing, then what do you do? Right yes. Now? Yes. So, so if it's the deep space, you know, nebulae or a galaxy 28 million light years away, then then what do you do? Yeah. Right. So what is a Yeah. So what are the characteristics of a good telescope that would serve as a base for astrophotography? Mm -hmm. Well, we have a saying here at, in the office at OPT. When someone wants to do astrophotography, there are three things that we always tell them. These three 
are the most important parts about astrophotography. Number one, it's the mount. Number two, it's the mount. You could probably guess what number three is. Uh, the mount. You got yeah, it. Yeah. Hey. <laughs> yeah. And that's true. And the reason is because um, the earth is spinning. I think most of us still believe that. Um, <laughs> and so with, uh, with that being the case, you know, there's an apparent motion to the sky. You're and so going to blow just... up my live chat, man, with that. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. Oops. So, yeah. If, um, if the sky, so you have this apparent motion of the sky. If you just do a long exposure, say you just started doing exposures for 15 minutes, you're going to see that motion in your image. You're going to see star trails through the image, right? Um, so what you do instead is you get something even as small as this thing. So this is, this is one of my favorite products in existence, but this is a okay, hold Skywatcher. it steady. Hold it steady when you hold it up. There yep. you go. Skywatcher, Star Adventurer, right? Can you see that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. So this thing, you see how small it is. This thing fits in a camera bag and uh, you can carry this around. It goes on a regular photographic tripod and mounting this, it's exactly what it will do is it will spin the opposite direction at exactly the rate the earth is spinning. So you can do long exposures and not have those trails in the image. So that makes sense. So you're tracking the target now. Yeah. And so when you're saying, how do you get those, those really faint objects? It's exactly that. You have to, uh, you know, do a much longer exposure instead of maybe 30 seconds. Maybe you go to two minutes or five minutes. I mean, some of my exposures, I just did 90 hours on one target, you know. Um, but with a tracking mount, you can do that and you're not going to have these trails and your image is still going to be very sharp, like nothing was moving at all. And so something like that, very inexpensive. I mean, you can get an entire rig, tripod and everything for under 500 bucks, throw your camera on that. And now you can track whatever you want. Now you're shooting nebulae, galaxies and whatever you want. That's how people get these amazing Andromeda photos, little tracking mounts. like this. Yeah. But what's the weight limitations on that thing? So you're looking at a, a camera putting on a DSLR on top of that with a with sure. just a standard lens, you're not going to be mounting some long tube on there, right? Sure. So this is the smallest option, you know, and this one can hold six pounds. So yeah, you're right. This one would be for your camera and using the lens as your telescope, one of your lenses. But when you're going to use a, um, a telescope itself, it's the exact same concept. It's just the mount gets bigger. So the capacity goes from six pounds to maybe 25 or 50. And the, the, let me grab this. So the telescopes don't have to be big. Uh, let's see if you can kind of see this here. This is the Vixen VSD. This is not not at all a big telescope. You can see that thing. What's right? the diameter of that objective? This is a 100. Okay, 100, 100 millimeter. Okay. Yeah, so 100 millimeters, this little CCD camera attached to the back. Look at that. How much right? does that sucker weigh? Uh, I don't, you know, I don't even know off the top of my head. It's not, not heavy at all. Okay. Um, I mean, you can use this on the small, very, very small mounts. And, um, that's about a half a stone for those of you in the UK. <laughs> okay. And so, um, yeah, I mean, that scope is what we use for a lot of the images we post here at OPT is that, that very, very small telescope. And one of the, the scopes I'm bringing around, you know, the world with me this next year is the same size. And uh, some of the best photos I've ever taken were with small, very, very small telescopes like that. The one Ian uses is even smaller than that. It's yep. like the size of a can of tennis balls. It's about this big. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. All right. I need one of those guys. I need one of those so I can do a video on them. How, how much does that cost? Seven ninety nine. Oh, yeah. Think. So it's the price of a camera lens, but essentially, when you look at a telescope, that's all it is—is is a camera. That's lens. right. That's that's a great yeah. point. I'm glad you brought that up. Some of these camera lenses, if you've ever gone to rocket launches like I do all the time, you see these guys with these really long camera lenses that look essentially like a telescope, and that's really what all camera lenses are—they're refracting telescopes of varying diameters and uh, focal lengths. So that's right. all you're doing is putting a telescope in front of your camera. All the time. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I've got a system at home, like this little, little system. And then I've got the observatory where that thing's, you know, 14 feet tall. And they do exactly the same thing. You look at them just like camera lenses. I mean, this, this Vixen VSD I just showed you is F3.8. So it's super fast. The telescope I have in the observatory, the big plane wave is F6.2. So it's a lot slower. I have to do longer exposures, even though it's bigger. Uh, you know, and that's kind of, that when you're shopping for telescopes, you shop just like you would for camera lenses based on what you're trying to do. Are you going wide angle? Or are you trying to get 
really magnified on the object? What are you trying to do? And you look at it just like you would a camera lens. Yeah. Now, guys, I wanted to say I put a link to OPT Telescope's uh, website in the description box. But what we're going to do in the future, and I just thought of this as Dustin was talking, is if we're going to talk about specific things, we need to give links uh, to those things so you guys can see, get more information while we're doing the Hangout. Uh, but uh, yeah, so I will talk with Dustin after this hangout and I'll put more more uh, um, uh, precise links to point to these actual things uh, that he's talked about right. already and the hangout so you guys can go straight there and not have to guess oh is this what he talked about on the hangout or whatever so yeah. uh, I'll do that after this hangout but in, in, in the future we'll we'll be a little bit more prepared and, and do that going and on. we've built out we've built out some kits because it's a lot of the same question over and over it's like what what's the absolute minimum i need to buy to get started so we built kits that are exactly that like a full kit camera and everything included for under a thousand dollars and then another one you want a little bit higher quality uh here's two thousand dollars you can change you can get more targets with this or you can shoot faster with this and then all the way up to five thousand dollars right and now you're talking about those images that you see where people are posting them and getting you know awards for them and you see them in magazines and everything else and so yeah, yeah I mean, it doesn't this is this this just shows you how much times have changed folks because back in the day i sold telescopes in, in boulder back in uh, 1984 when halley's comet was coming around and it was a lot like selling computers in the sense that when people would come in i used to sell computers too and they would come in and, and a family would say we want a computer so we can do our homework and spreadsheet and you know la 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 and oh yeah it would be nice to play games well, by just adding that little requirement, the price of the computer they needed just doubled, right? Or even quadrupled because playing games requires the best hardware. It was the same with telescopes. Oh, I'd like a telescope. We just want to see the moon, maybe Saturn, and we want to see Halley's Comet when it comes around. And oh, yeah, it'd be nice to take some photos. And by doing that, you just added a lot to uh, the cost of the telescope. Well, nowadays, that's not true. Um, what, what these guys have done, and what I think is great, is you can now set your own price point for what you want to spend and be able to image the freaking Orion Nebula or the Ring Nebula or you know the Andromeda Galaxy. These are all things within reach of these telescopes, and it's never been easier. Um, oh, for sure. For so. sure. Yeah. And, and we absolutely want to make it as accessible as possible to the point where even if you can't afford a telescope, even if you can't afford the DSLR, whatever it is, but you just have an obsession with space and you want to try to shoot it, get in touch with me or Ian or somebody here at OPT and let us know. I mean, we'll get you in. We, we're building observatories around the world for that reason, just to give people access to it so that you can you know, explore your own universe. So it's something that, you know, if you want to shoot, we'll make sure that you can one way or another. <laughs> right. And the, um, let me get, let me get to Superluminal's question. He's asking on Discord. He wants to know if you should use a telescope or a DSLR lens. What do you, what do you guys think? What's your response to that? I mean, it really depends on what you want to do. Uh, the DSLR lens, you're definitely going to get a wide field shot. Now, if you want to use a telescope, again, it depends on what you want to use. And that's why if you, if you ask us, if you ask one of our sales techs, hey, I'm interested in astrophotography, what do I need? They're going to come at you with a lot of questions because you can go in tons of different routes. And we just want to make sure we get you the setup that fits exactly what you're trying to do. So it really depends on what you want to do. Do you want to do planetary, galaxies, nebula, astro landscape? You know, it's, it's all these different things that you can choose from. Just let us know what you're interested in doing. And we're definitely going to uh, get somebody to help you step by step walk you through the process so you can be getting some fantastic images so what are what are kind of the differences then i guess if there there's the question that i would have then it would be what is the benefit to a camera lens what's the benefit to a telescope right i mean that's the the obvious question right I think. and so what i mean if somebody says why would i shoot a telescope or if somebody asked me that if they say why would i shoot a telescope over my camera lens, if both of them are at 300 millimeters, I've got a telephoto camera lens at 300 millimeters and I've got a telescope at 300 millimeters. Why would I shoot the telescope? You know? And yeah. I mean, is that, is that kind of what you're getting at? Is that, is that the type of question? Yeah. And I think yeah. another, another uh, part of it would be, you know, what are the, what can a DSLR lens, ver uh, what can a telescope do versus what a DSLR lens can do? And you're, you're sure. right. Uh, that, so there is, so let, answer that question. Why would you yep. pick a 300 millimeter telescope over a 300 millimeter DSLR lens first? Well, the first thing is that most 
most uh, camera lenses have a ton of glass in them, a ton. Like even these small lenses, some of them have 18 and 20 elements in them to get everything to focus, get all the colors to focus properly. And with a telescope like that VSD I just showed you, you're going to be under five elements in some of these, some four elements in these, you know, in a lot of, so most of the uh, apochromatic refractors, the color corrected refractors that you see are called triplets because they only have three elements. And so you're going to get a much, much cleaner, much sharper image without 18 elements being, you know, refracting that light 18 different times trying to get it to focus than you are with something, you know, when you have something that's as simple as a three element design that gets all the colors corrected as close to perfect as possible uh, with as the minimal number of elements in the design. Yeah. Right? And you're not losing light with these telescopes. So when you add a, a new element, if you add more glass, you're reflecting more light away. So the more elements you add, the more light you're losing. So using one of these telescopes, like Dustin was saying, a three element telescope versus a DSLR lens that has 18 or 20 elements, those 18 to 20 elements, each piece of glass is reflecting light. So that means this three element lens of a telescope, that's reflect reflecting very little light, which means you're getting the most light onto your sensor as possible. What, well, what do you mean that, that I thought they're clear? Uh, if they're clear, how come? What do you mean when they're reflecting light? <laughs> so uh, I, I believe you studied physics. Is that correct, I, Tony? I did. Yeah, I'm leading. <laughs> this is called leading you <laughs> to answer a question, Ian. I am leading you into a topic. <laughs> how can yeah. a cl Ian? How can a clear piece piece of glass reflect light? I don't understand. <laughs> yeah. So uh, whenever you have light hitting uh, a surface and going into another medium, you're always going to get some percentage transmitted and some percentage reflected. You're never going to get 100% transmission. And so when you hit, say, a lens, you're going to get some of that reflected off. Sure, m maybe it'll be 10% of the light, 5% of the light. But if you're doing these long exposures, that five or ten percent difference, you're going to see that in your images. And every photon counts, so you don't want to be throwing away that's any right. photons. And where I was that's going right. is that no, and Ian said it. There's no piece of glass that's perfect in every surface. Like even my glasses here, there is a reflection coming. Some of that light is being reflected off. And on the other side, when it, when the light goes through my glasses, on the other side of that surface, it, there's also there's two reflections per element of glass in in uh in, in any optical system and you can reduce that by the type of glass some types of glass are better than others uh, it used to be back in the day quartz was good or shot there was something called shot glass was really good s c h o t t not s h o t uh glass <laughs> but the uh uh and and they also reduce it with coatings coatings are your friend what about the coatings on telescope lenses versus camera lenses are they better are they they're certainly designed for anti-reflection right right well that's that's exactly it they're designed they're purpose built for this use and so you're i mean you'll definitely notice the difference beyond just the you know when you have all this glass too you get a lot of aberrations that you're not going to deal with you know like coma you see weird stars in the corners um when people are building camera lenses companies are building camera lenses, they're generally building them for the purpose of people shooting them for their 99%, yeah. which is going to be shoot taking pictures of their family, going to the park, whatever, going to the zoo. That's what these camera lenses are built for. And then people use them for astrophotography. With a telescope, you could take it to the zoo if you wanted to, but that's not what it's built for. And it's not going to perform as well at the zoo as your camera lenses. But if you put it under the night sky, which is exactly what it's built for, it's going to outperform things that weren't built for that purpose. And you're not going to see all the reflections that you're talking about, which really diminish contrast in the image. So the darks in the image aren't quite as dark on a camera lens and the brights aren't going to pop quite as much. You know, it's uh, people with refractors. You get this whole click of people who just are absolutely in love with refractors. I'd probably count myself among them. Um, they're just, uh, you know, the images just pop on a refractor. Um, and so you kind of see what people describe as diamonds on a velvet background. And it's, it's true. These, these triplet refractors just produce these ultra contrasty images. And I guess I would 
point out that that is something that you're really only going to see a difference in, in my opinion, you guys can tell me if you disagree, in imaging, uh, refractors versus reflectors. There's still no substitute for diameter <laughs> when you uh, are looking at the stars or looking at very faint deep sky objects. And you can tell the difference uh, in brightness, at least, when you look through a 20-inch Dobsonian at the Ring Nebula versus a uh, you know 100 millimeter refractor at uh, the mm-hmm. same thing. You can see a difference. Now, there are things like contrast, which, you know, Dustin's talking about, which I agree. You, you, you can, if you're really good at and practiced at observing, you might tell a difference, but really it starts to come out through imaging. And another reason that imaging is great about, uh, you know, for refractors is that you can get away with a smaller diameter because unlike your retina, which doesn't, you know, if you stare at an object with your eye, it doesn't keep getting brighter, but a CCD or a CMOS detector, it will. It will. The longer you stare at a uh, object with a camera, the brighter it will get. Which brings me to things like processing. Do beginner astrophotographers have to worry much about processing, taking calibration images? Do you want to go into that, or um, I think we should at least mention it? But you tell me. Sure. Yeah. And I don't want to. I don't want to give anybody the wrong idea about refractors versus reflectors. I'm not in any way saying that refractors are better you just I'm did. saying yeah, that you did. They're, they're, they're small they're easy <laughs> you don't have to collimate them you know but it's hard to tell nasa who makes like 99.9 percent of their telescopes reflectors you know the hubble's not a big refractor you know and they they do that for a reason reflectors always are going to get better color correction than any refractor so you know there's a lot of benefits to reflectors for sure and like you said you can get a lot of aperture so when you use them visually it's you're going to always aperture wins visually hands down every time it just right. wins and so, um, yeah, I just wanted to clear that up before we moved on. But oh, I process- know you knew that. I just wanted to point out yeah. the, the difference with with visual stuff again. Today. Sure, yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, if you want to go into processing, I mean, that is that is a uh, that's a pretty deep hole. It's a talk on its own. <laughs> well, okay, but but for a beginner who is trying to take an image of the of M fifty seven, I'm just going to use the Ring Nebula as an example. Um, it's pretty dim. It's pretty faint. And if you take to see it and all you've, and if you've got a hundred millimeter refractor, a 300 millimeter refractor, you're going to need some serious exposure time on that to be able to see anything. Right. What would, what would be a general exposure time? At least two or three minutes, right? Yeah, probably, probably two minutes would be pretty good on most fast lenses. And the problem with digital cameras is that when you hold them open, yes, you collect more light, but you Mm -hmm. also are subjected to noise Mm -hmm. and, what astronomical cameras do is they cool that CCD to remove a lot of, or to uh, mitigate a lot of the noise that comes out of it. And it's in two forms. It's electronic noise, but it's also thermal noise. And this mm-hmm. is if just heat causing a, a sort of a static in the image. And the longer your exposure times, the more that gets worse, that dark, or right. it's called dark current. And um, you might benefit a lot from taking it out. It's not hard to do. But that could be a very rudimentary first step in calibrating your images, right? Is yeah, yeah. So taking and I can show you this scope again. It's got the camera like you're talking about. Um, that the whole back end of this camera, if you see here, is a cooler. So that's exactly what you're you're talking about. Is taking the heat away from the sensor so you don't build up that thermal noise. Uh, but on the other side of it, you can take calibration frames called dark frames where you just accept the noise, but you tell, um, you tell the, the pr- uh, program itself what it should expect that noise to be so that it calibrates it out. And uh, most cameras now will do that for you with something called LENR, which is long exposure noise reduction. It's a setting in almost every DSLR, every mirrorless camera. If you turn that on, what it does is it takes your photo and then it closes the shutter and takes the exact same photo and then subtracts that from the first one. So it takes that thermal noise buildup out of your image for you. Oh, do, do the Fuji cameras do that too? Or is it? Yeah, they do. They do. Just wow. about all, all of the brands do that now. Yeah. Okay. So, and it's really quite amazing to see the difference. If you look at a three minute exposure of the Ring Nebula, you'll see 
a lot of fog all the way around it. But the minute you subtract that out, it pops. The 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 all of the the dark current that was there is gone, and the background is black, and the contrast is really a lot a lot higher. And if it does it in the For camera, sure. you don't even have to think about it. But you are doing processing by doing that. So that is a first step in in calibrating images. So that's that's something to be aware of. And it makes a huge of. difference when you start stretching your images, which uh, is like like Ian said, that's a talk all its own, but yeah, we should probably have one on, on image processing, I guess. Yeah, yeah, that's a great idea. Yeah, but when you start stretching your images, all of that stuff comes out and any noise that is there, it's going to be amplified and so it's really good to get that done early on and to get the best data you possibly can right out of the gate so that you can manipulate it more after the fact. Okay. Let me read Nick Hardy's comment. Hi, Tony. Just to let you know, I modified my own Canon camera. There are a lot of tutorials on YouTube showing you what to do. So that was back when we were talking about astro modifying. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Cool. Yeah. All right. Cool, yeah, I man. figured we probably had some people here that had done that. <laughs> <laughs> That's one thing I love about this community, man. It's like everywhere you go, people are just hyper intelligent, you know, and you see people doing things that in any other community yeah, would just be absurd. They're, yeah, and they're not tools about it. You know, people are yeah. really nice. They just really want to, if they see you're interested in it, they really genuinely want to cultivate that interest and, and answer yeah. your questions and look, you can look through their telescopes, use their equipment, yep. all kinds of really cool things. Yeah. And yeah, if absolutely. you don't know about it. Astro Clubs yet, you need to find one near you and just go check mm -hmm. them out. The nicest people will be there. Ever. Oh, yeah. Right. So, okay. Cool. Uh, well, what, what do you think? So, okay, we've covered, uh, we've covered using just a camera to take pictures of the, of the night sky. We've, you've talked about your, you've got telescope packages that for a variety of dollar entry points, you can get different kinds of capabilities. Um, anything else we should mention? What about those who already have a telescope and they want to start taking photos with it? Right. Do you have any um, general advice for those guys? Yeah. So depending on what kind of telescope you have, um, let's assume you have, say, an LX200 or a, a Celestron Nexstar, you know, some kind of fork mounted um, telescope. So those aren't generally good for long exposure astrophotography, but you can definitely do solar. You can definitely do planetary. And so what you do is you just use a high speed uh, camera, take tons of frames, thousand, two thousand frames, you know, point your telescope at Jupiter, put your your high speed camera in ones from like ZWO or QHY, drop them in where you would put your eyepiece, take a thousand, two thousand frames, use software to stack that image all together. And boom, you have a shot of Jupiter. Mm -hmm. You have a shot of Saturn. You got an amazing shot of the sun. So it's super, super simple to get shots, even with like a, a telescope that's not necessarily made for astrophotography. And so, and uh, I guess uh, you talked briefly about using, just using a, a, a smartphone in front of the eyepiece, but you're saying that you can get other accessories that, you know, like would, would they fit into the, the, the eyepiece holder? These, these, these different things. Yeah. So generally like, let's here. actually we got, I'm sure you recognize this one, Tony. Oh yes, that's 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 the only <laughs> scope I still own. <laughs> well, that's not true. I still have my Astro Scan. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so the the Coronado PST. This is a, a dedicated H Alpha solar telescope. Now, normally you just drop an eyepiece in here, but what you can do is get a short uh, ZWO nose nose piece that drops your camera right into here, or you can use a Starlight Express camera like a Lodestar and Ultra Star. Drop it in where you would normally put your eyepiece. And you could take pictures of the sun and it's, it's, it's an H alpha, not just white light. So you can get those prominences. You can get those surface details. And the PST is generally run around 500 bucks. Super simple, super easy way to get into solar astrophotography. Mm -hmm. And it's one of the most amazing telescopes you can get. I can't believe the price because back, H alpha filters used to be incredibly expensive and this is about imaging i won't go into it too much but they used to cost just the filter itself I, there was a company called daystar back in the day that made one for three thousand dollars it fit onto the back of your c8 telescope and it had water cooling and all kinds of it because they're, they're very sensitive to temperature or at least they used to be and now they just fit they have these etalon filters in the uh, telescope path or the optics path itself that don't require any cooling and you get quarter to a half angstrom bandwidth at H alpha, which we don't have to know what that means yet, other than to say that the narrower the bandwidth, the more contrast you see on the sun, which equals awesome, because if you could see active regions on the sun, filament eruptions going off, 
uh, prominences on the limb, all of it is just absolutely stunning. I can't believe uh, how how much the price of those has come has come down. So I, oh yeah, one day we're going to talk about solar imaging, but that <laughs> telescope still my all time favorite. I'm not getting rid of mine for nothing. Yeah, that's cool that you own one of those. I was the first time I used one of those. I was absolutely blown away by it because I'd seen through big solar scopes, you know. But those are, like you said, they're they're still ten thousand dollars for the huge ones, you know. Uh, yeah. But then I saw this little thing. I was like, ah, this is going to be, you know, there's no way this is going to be impressive. And you look through, it and it's it's so incredible yeah. what you can see through that tiny thing. And they're half angstrom, I think, off the shelf. Now, the one the professional ones tend to be a quarter angstrom or less. Mm -hmm. Uh, because they need to see the granularity on the solar solar uh, photosphere or the chromosphere, I should say, and they right. need to see the um uh you know the detail in the in the solar prominences, which you lack at half angstrom. But mm -hmm. for what you're paying for, I, and I paid five hundred for mine, and I think they're up to seven or something like that now. But you know that's still really good. That's a good price for. Yeah, for yeah, we get them in used too. Actually, this one right here is used, so you know it'll be quite a bit cheaper than that. And it's just, it's such a cool thing. Even just to bring, you could bring that thing to a parking lot somewhere and everybody that walks by is going to be like, I can't believe I'm seeing the sun. Like yeah. <laughs> you also have to be careful, don't you? We have to say, now don't do this with a regular telescope. But, right, yeah. right, right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So let me, um, uh, Peter Quinn's asking, can you get an app for your phone for rendering? Uh, I think what he means is, can you get one that does the dark subtractions and stuff? Uh, for your uh we have second. um so we sell we sell something called the stellar mate that we should probably talk about so for for really anyone getting into it i mean it's only 150 dollars, and it's the computer included so it's a 150 fifty dollar computer that comes with all the software that you need to do this stuff and so yeah it will capture darks flats biases <laughs> anything you wanted to capture plus your light. So plus the images themselves. And so for, yeah, people getting into imaging on that level, I mean, this thing, and you can take it all the way up to running an entire observatory if you go that far. So uh, 150 bucks, it's called the Stellar Mate. And uh, it's pretty, pretty unreal. And that program like that, like I said, it comes preloaded with the software. You know, I was just thinking as you were talking about that, we let's, let's do a quick mention. We've got about 10 minutes left. Let's do a quick mention of, what the live observatory or the remote observatories that you guys operate and you're working a little bit with Fraser on this as well. You want to talk about those a little bit because what you do is you actually do imaging from those right. telescopes, right? What kind of, what yes. kind of setup is that? So we have, uh, we have a lot of them. We have this project going on. We call it the observatory project around here. It was actually the staff's idea and we just ran with it. It, uh, we're building two telescopes or two observatories that are completely remotely operated. And we're building two of them in every land based time zone in the world. And so right now we have six of them, but, um, what we do is we build these things out. You can control them from your cell phone. You log in, the roof rolls off the building from wherever you are. We have like, we could control one in Texas right now, right? And so we let people log into those for free and help them get their own images. We let schools use them. We use them. The staff uses them. That's where a lot of my pictures come from. Um, I do projects on Instagram where I let five people team up at a time from around the world, all shoot one target together and then combine them. And they get some of the, I mean, a pod level images, absolutely incredible images, even people that have never shot before. But yeah, these, this project is entirely just to make space accessible where it was not accessible before. So this is high end equipment out in the middle of the darkest skies in the world, completely free to use. And how do people apply for time on these? Or do you, do you, do you invite them? Do they? So go ahead. Yeah. So right now, the way it works is we use an app called Calendly. We're still in the testing stages because we know there's so many people that want to use them on how we're scheduling. And that's been the biggest problem. So the observatories themselves and getting them to work now is pretty easy. We're building them. They work every time. I mean, Ian actually has an observatory going up next week. Um, but what we're finding is that the calendar software isn't as easy. The scheduling software isn't as easy to get one person out and the next person in. So if anybody has any ideas there, we're super open to it. But what we're using now is called Calendly. And the best thing you can do right now until we nail that down is just contact one of us. You can reach out to me on Instagram at Gibson Picks or OPT Corp or Ian himself. He runs the, the entire marketing department here. So uh, if you let us know you want to do it, we'll definitely make sure you can get in and control these telescopes. And they're telescopes of every type. And I think what you were mentioning was the um, the virtual star parties. Right. 
that we do. Yeah, so we do we hold star parties that you can log into and watch for free and participate in. You watch the telescope move around and we show the live images in color <laughs> off of the scope as they come in. For whatever you want to see, it's a full tour of the night sky. Yeah, that that one I I like to call it astronomy by request. <laughs> <laughs> on demand. Yeah. 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 Astronomy yeah. on demand. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, we're going to be doing some stuff together, too, I think, in the future with this stuff as well. So keep stay yeah. tuned for that, guys. Um, but th So there's a lot of levels you can get involved. That, uh, without spending a dime, gets you access to some of the best telescopes in the world, the best equipment in the world for images that you can take yourself, uh, as well as all of the other techniques that we've outlined. So... Okay, guys, we've got about five minutes with the, to close out this hangout, what, let, has there anything we haven't covered that you want to make sure beginning astrophotographers know? Uh, yeah, you know, if, uh, unless anybody here has questions that we can answer directly, I think one thing that might be helpful is with us diving into this podcasting, right? Because we're, those aren't live and we're recording them, but the whole purpose is to serve the uh, amateur astronomy community. That is the entire purpose of the podcast, right? So uh, maybe we should mention that, uh, that that is really, we want people to guide us there. And this is a good place for people to kind of give us, hey, this was interesting. Why don't you guys do a full podcast? On yeah, because whatever? because of the nature of podcasts that there are one way you do, you syndicate them and you distribute them out. It's harder to get direct feedback. So if you if you comment on any of the uh, deep astronomy hangouts, uh, as well as uh, I I also have a profile on Anchor.fm, which is an app you can have on your phone to listen to hangouts on or to listen to podcasts on, and you can comment and actually send. Uh, feedback to us that way that's another way uh you and you can also go to the discord server that i have here and say tony can you answer this on your podcast and we'll be more than happy to uh to do that kind of stuff so make sure that you use all of those different avenues between uh gibson picks and uh on on instagram also opt uh uh i think it's opt corp on facebook is that right OPT telescopes OPT on Facebook. Telescopes on Facebook. Yeah. Use their social media. Use my social media. You guys have been uh, follow me around for a while, so you guys know all the different platforms I have. I'm looking at all of them, and we'll and we will uh, answer your questions. But he, but Dustin's right. We you wanna you wanna use that resource because we'll be more than happy to focus an entire podcast on it if it takes that. So mm -hmm. uh, sure. uh, real quick question from Superluminal: uh, Do you know anything about the Pentax DSLR function auto auto tracer? Yeah, so uh, Pentax has done something pretty incredible. So the Pentax new, the new Pentax cameras, uh, they they have image stabilization, which happens at the sensor. So the sensor moves. That's really not new technology, but a lot of cameras are kind of adopting it, and it's it's ending up everywhere now. So that you don't have to be on a tripod; you can hold the camera in that shake that's in your hands. Uh, the sensor moves enough to stabilize that. But what they did was because they can move the sensor, they started moving the sensor to track instead of having a mount. So it can actually do not long exposures, but it can do longer exposures from the hood of your car or, you know, a, a stationary tripod without having to be tracking, which is pretty incredible when you think technologies move that far that it's tracking the stars for you. So it's it, it, if you were to hold it as steady as you could with your hands, it would not only overcome the jitter of your hands, but it would maybe track the stars a little bit as far as the, uh, it could for well, I don't, range of motion. I, you know, I don't know if it can do both. I think it's more like set it down to where it's stationary and let the ah, okay. tracking piece do that. Yeah. Okay. So. I haven't used it yet. I've just heard about it. I just met with the Pentax guys a couple of weeks ago and they were telling me about it. It's the first I'd heard about it and I was just kind of blown away by it. <laughs> oh, cool. All right. Well, I, yeah, 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 I definitely want to check that out. All right. All right. Well, um, I think we, well, we're out of time. I may just do one more quick uh, check of the live chat, make sure we're good. Uh, I haven't forgot anything. Um, uh, Glassy is going is it also on SoundCloud SoundCloud I don't know let me talk to Dustin about that I I the, she's talking about the podcast and I um SoundCloud is not cheap and so I was not putting it on there initially but we might I'll talk to Dustin about it um mm -hmm. Nick Hardy is asking can you only take full color images with those free telescopes or also H alpha H alpha or oxygen photos so do you have filters so on your we have uh, scopes put up of every type. So we have monochrome chips, we have color chips, we have planetary chips, we have everything. So, um, yeah, you can shoot really whatever you like. 
Okay, cool. All right. Well, that is it for this Hangout, guys. I want to thank you. This has been good. So we'll be back next week, actually, uh, with another Hangout with, with Dustin. Maybe I think, Ian, you're going to be there too, right? Maybe? Yep, that's okay. right. We're going to be talking about the five uh, top most popular telescopes uh at opt so that'll be next week and so so we got two amateur ones in a row because that's just how it worked out with the scheduling so but but after that we'll be back to alternating alternating uh hangouts so we'll see you guys next thursday i'm sorry next tuesday uh this thursday join me uh for the astro coffee hangout with carol christian where we're going to be talking about the hubble space telescope she's going to be giving us an update on the gyros uh apparently it's back up uh, it's back up and running so you want to join us on thursday for astro coffee so that'll be uh the next this thursday and then next tuesday we'll be back with telescope talk Okay, well, that is it for this Hangout, folks. Thank you all so much for watching. And as always, keep looking up. Thanks.